Hello class. Today we are going to go over the rise of a shogun in Japan. So I hope you are all staying safe and doing well. Um, I know we are all certainly missing you and hoping that we can return soon. Um, so I want to go ahead and remind you all that um, yesterday I asked you to please print this graphic organizer. So if you did, um, go ahead and take that out. I have mine here. Um, this will be helpful for you as we go through our, les our lesson today. Remember this is posted in our Google Docs. Um, our Google Classroom and it's under our docs and a list of things we will have under there for today. We also have our slideshow, the assignment um, to follow up this lecture, as well as a link to the PowerPoint uh, that I've created. Um, so please get out your graphic organizer. Take notes. Um, if I move too fast through these notes, remember that I am posting this on YouTube. And so you can pause, you can rewind on YouTube. You can actually slow down the um, recording. And so if I'm speaking too fast, you can slow it down. Um, and you can also, if you need to type in this graphic organizer, it's just to help you organize your thoughts um, and help you for our assignment later. So today I am going to, or to start, I'm going to review our lesson from yesterday. Yesterday we did a spatial thinking analysis on Japan's geography. So Japan consists of thousands of islands. Um, it's near Korea, Russia, and China. So the Sea of Japan separates the Asian continent from them. Um, around 50% of the country is mountainous. Our, the current capital is Tokyo. Their current language is Japanese. And their current government is a parliamentary government with a constitutional monarchy. So just some things to keep in mind while we're going through our lesson today. Um, is just the geography of Japan and the spatial thinking analysis that we did yesterday. So this map is what we are going to be using for our lesson. Um, if we need to reference it at any time, you may. The first we are going to today talk about these five sections here. Um, I know that it is a little bit, there's a lot of details here, and so I want to make sure that I'm really um, helping you guys explain this, and so I'm going to split our lesson into two. So today we'll discuss the first section, um, the Chinese ideas that lead to a strong central government in Japan, the Fujiwara family gains control over the emperor, the capital is burned by warning families, um, and then it's later rebuilt, but there's a war going on during this time we'll discuss. The Minamoto destroys the tiara. A Minamoto show begun, becomes the first shogun. And then the shogun's capital has more power than the emperor's. So some things I want you to notice, we will mostly be talking about the rise today of the shogun period and then the fall of the shogun period will be later in this section um, which will be tomorrow's lesson. So some main families that we will be discussing today are the Fujiwara, Minamoto, and the Tiara. So keep those in mind as well. Um, these are main land-owning families, so these are very important families in Japan during this time period. Um, all right, and then... What we're going to do in this video is talk about roughly a thousand years of Japanese history that take us from what's known as the classical period of Japan through the Japanese medieval period, 
all the way to the early modern period. And the key defining characteristic of the classical period is this is when Japan really began to unify and have an imperial form and began to borrow a lot of the traditions and philosophy and even religion from China. Then as we get into the medieval period, Japan gets fragmented. It comes under military rule. And then as we get into the early modern period, it gets reunited. So as I mentioned, China had a huge influence on Japan. Even though China never conquers Japan, because of how close they are, many things like the idea of a centralized bureaucracy, the Japanese borrow many of these ideas from China during the classical period. In fact, the Japanese rulers sent delegations to China in the 7th century in order to understand all of what the Chinese do in order to run their government, to run their country. And they start to borrow a lot of the ideas of Buddhism and Confucianism and merge it with some of their own beliefs, which are often known as Shinto, which you can view as the original Japanese belief system. So the first part of the classical period that we're going to go into some depth is the Heian period. It's capital at Heian Kyo, modern day Kyoto. And as I mentioned, it was known for taking a lot of these ideas from China, and particularly the Tang dynasty in China, and bringing them to Japan. The Heian period was known as a golden age of Japan. It was a time of culture, it was a time of architecture. People in the imperial court would focus on the arts, they would focus on philosophy. As an example, this right over here is the Byodoen temple in Kyoto, which shows the level, and this is actually only part of it, and it shows the level of cultural advancement of this time. As I mentioned, the arts were a big deal, and women in the imperial court of Heian, China, had a lot of influence. In fact, the most influential family, the Fujiwara family, maintained its influence by having the emperors marry women from their family. And those women would end up having a lot of control over the emperor and of course the next emperor. But to get a sense of the arts of this period, here's an excerpt from The Tale of Genji, which was written by Lady Murasaki, who was believed to be a member of the Fujiwara family. And Lady Murasaki gets a lot of credit before Chaucer, before Shakespeare, she is by many historians viewed as the first true novelist that we know of in human history, not just Japanese history. But I encourage you to read it. It's, it's actually quite riveting, <laughs> the tale of Genji. And this is just a small quote from that story or from that novel. It's about a very handsome prince, Genji. The difference between enlightenment and confusion is of about the same order as the difference between the good and the bad in a romance. If one takes the generous view, then nothing is empty and useless. To refresh our memories here, we'll talk about the Japanese feudal structure and their, their system. So as we're looking through this, um, the political features of Shogunate Japan is how the country was run. Um, this is a little bit different during the Shogun period. We have our emperor and our Shogun. Um, the emperor and the Shogun during the Shogunate period are essentially equivalent. They're both figureheads. And as you see, they are supposed to be a part of the warrior class. They are political leaders. Um, so the political system was ran by the government, which were the shoguns during that time. The political system is a feudal system that was developed in 710 CE. Um, it is a very complex system. It, um, the system is similar to other feudal systems. So it has our figurehead, which is the emperor, at the top of the system. So the emperor is a monarch leader and their job is to run the entire empire. Um, during this 
time that we will be discussing later on the Shogun period, the emperor did not have say. Um, the Shoguns were at the top. So this period, this pyramid is showing us the structure of the empire. It is clear that the emperor is on the top, followed by the Shogun and the Daimyo and the Samurai, so on and so forth. Um, they, the Shogun are political leaders. And during this time, the uh, Shoguns lost, or sorry, the emperor lost their power. We'll just leave it at that for now. Um, as a side note, I want to point out that only 10% of Japan's population at this time was in the top section. So this top section is only 10% of Japan. Um, starting the peasants, the merchants, the lower classes are 90% of Japan's population. So please keep that in mind as well about the population. Um, just that this is 90% these lower and at only 10% are the upper class and the, the, the people making the decisions. So first we're going to do a quick little summary of the shogunate period. This is a period of time where Japan was ruled by the shoguns instead of their emperor. This period of time roughly lasted a thousand years from 700 CE to 2000 CE. Um, here I'll define a shogun for you. The title of the title for a military commander in ancient Japan, so in the 8th century to the 12th century, and later for a ruler of shogunate Japan. The word shogun comes from the Japanese words sho, meaning commander, and gun, meaning troops. So commander of troops. Um, this is the timeline of what we'll be discussing today. So the Nara period is where we will start, and then we'll move into the Haiyan period, and then next the Kamakura period. And I do apologize if I am saying any of these names um, in the lesson wrong. I have done a lot of research and I've watched a lot of videos, so I just don't speak any Japanese. So if anyone can correct me, I would surely love that. Um, so I'm going to draw a line right here. This is where we are going to, um, I just want to make sure I was still recording. This is where we will end today and then tomorrow's lesson will cover the last section, which will be the fall of the Shogun. Um, so Nara, Japan, and I really apologize about this. I'm going to put that line over it because I did not mean to leave that. So the Chinese ideas lead to a strong central government in Japan. So the Chinese government is the main um, focus of this. The Japan was a very small island a very, they did not have central government, they didn't have um, literature or language or anything like that. So in the mid 500s, which is a little bit before this time period, the Japanese were wanting to learn new things. So they sent people to Korea and China to learn about their cultures. Um, the Chinese culture is very influential on Japan with, because Japan had no written language of their own. And so the Japanese, use the Chinese characters to spell out Japanese sounds and words. Um, Chinese was actually Japan's official language from during this time period. Um, and then another important figure to remember is Prince Shotoku was served, so he was serving during this time. Um, he is a major pusher of the Chinese culture. He took the idea of Chinese philosophies, uh, Chinese Confucianism, and brought it to Japan. He also encouraged the spread of Buddhism. And um, 
he really did push keeping Chinese uh, language and literature in Japan, but that did not work out um, for him. But he did bring um, Buddhism and they built large temples and out of bringing the government to Japan, the structure of government, then the Tang culture, um, they, sorry, not the Tang culture, the taxes are now collected more routinely and efficiently and things are running a lot smoother from Chinese I, government. Um, and then one last thing is arts and culture were deeply influenced by Japan um, or influenced on Japan. So the Fujiwara rise to power around 794 to 11. 85. So this is the start of the Haiyan period. Um, the beginning of the Nara, or end of Nara, beginning of Haiyan period. So Nakomito no Komatari was the founding father who helped the emperor gain power. This means that the emperor was siding with the Fujiwara clan. Now the Fujiwara clan started as just a family um, with a lot of money and a lot of power. They um, continued to grow. They, they got into the political system. They sided with the emperor. So there is now a constant battle happening for the throne between the Fujiwara and the imperial princes. Um, the Fujiwara eventually gained power for after some brutal political battles. So there is another, there's an, a battle that happens, um, I believe it. The Fujiwara clan kills the heirs to the throne um, in order to get to the throne. So some things to note are that the Fujiwara did do positive things for the community. They got rid of, um, or they reduced taxes in half. They created hospitals, charities. Um, they protected their community. And then their emperors began to create their own bureaucracy, similar to the Fujiwara clan. So going on behind the scenes the emperors are realizing that the fujiwara clan is more successful than the than they are right now and so they're they're teaming together and building their own bureaucracy um so then eventually they overthrew the fujiwara family um let's see if i Okay, um, these are some photos just to put some pictures to mind for you. These are the, this is the founding Fujiwara no Komatari, and this is his son. Um, they both ruled Fujiwara no Komatari actually died right as they became successful as Fujiwari, Fujiwara family. So as soon as kind of they took control and really fell into the government, then he died. And um, he, let's see, I have that written down somewhere here. Um, they, uh, Fujiwara no Komatari, passed away and his wife, I believe, and Fujiwara no Yoshifusa, Yoshifusa took over. So the, um, first before the Haiji disturbance, I wanted to discuss a little bit the culture during the Haiyan period. Um, the Japanese nobles create Stunning art, and so during the the Haiyan period, um, in a city that is now called Kyoto, the nobles 
um, had little to do with the common people. They they lived completely separate lives, completely apart. They seldomly left the city. So this is still during this time period here. Um, they loved beauty. They loved the um, you know, the nobles would dress up in beautiful silk robes. They carried big decorative fans, just kind of how they are dressing here. Um, they were lovers of written and spoken word. They loved to write and speak. They spent many hours writing in journals. Several women um, wrote in the Japanese language, even though the Chinese was still their official language. So. That's kind of interesting. And as a result, women actually wrote or were a huge portion of creating Japanese literature um, during this time. So, right. And moving on again, Haiyan period. So, during the Haiyan. Heiji dis disturbance. Um, the the conflicts arose due to the Hokan Rebellion. So, I found a quote that I thought described this disturbance very well. Um, the imperial family and the Fujiwara regents' house split the nobility into two factions. Each of them were enlisted warriors from the Minamoto and the Tiara, and so. Here we have two families battling face to face here. These two families caused a large, large war, a time of um, battling for the throne, battling for control and power. So this begins the decline of the direct imperial power in the early stages of the samurai class. So there was a, the conflict on a small scale was on a small scale, the outcome determined by a single night's fighting. Yet it was highly significant in that it demonstrated the inability of the um, courtiers to settle major differences without the reliance of the power of warriors. So Tiara Komiari is now in power of the land. Uh, this time period is then leads to Tiara is in charge for a long time and then it leads to the war. So before we discuss the war here, I want to take a look at this map um, just so that you can see the extent of how many places were affected by this war. Um, so many battles were fought all across Japan because of this. So um, the Genpei War is towards the end of the Haiyan period. A series of conflicts between the Tiara and the Minamoto clans is what created this war. Um, the Japanese Civil War is a war because of the battle for the throne and establishes the Komakara Shungate period, so the military rule. This is the time period when the shoguns take power. Um, major steps towards the Japanese consolidation is one nation, so this really starts to cons like bring Japan together. Um, many mo Minamoto no Yomari was now the title of the shogun. So I have another quote here. This war is the aftermath established red and white, uh, respective colors of the tiara, tiara and Minamoto um, as Japan's national colors. So today these colors can be seen on the flag, which is a fun little, um, this war is the defining colors for the flag of Japan that we know today. Um, these wars 
lasted five years as a battle to the throne. So just imagine how detrimental this is to Japan during this time um, and how things are really starting to fall apart in the emperor's perspective. So let's see. Here are all of our wars that we can we will discuss a little bit later. Um, so this is when I move myself out of the way so all of you can see the photo. Um, this is when the samurai and the shoguns begin to take over Japan. So while the Haiyan court um, is flourishing, the order is breaking down in Japan society. So by the end of this time period, so 1192 here, um, powerful nobles were openly at war. Rebels fought against imperial officials. Um, and Japan's rulers did not notice the problems growing in their country. So they did not notice this buildup until they really threw them off. Um, Japan's largest landowners, the daimyo, decided that they could not rely on the emperor anymore to protect them, so they hired samurai. Um, samurai is uh, per trained professional warriors that defended their property. So the daimyo and the samurai, um, the daimyo are no longer in control or controlled by the emperor. They have their own, they have their own samurai. So um, several noble clans decided to seize power themselves. Um, two of these clans fought for 30 years, which is the Tiara and the Minimoto. Um, and the um, ruler, okay, so then this is when the Kamakara period starts. So the emperor's capital was in Tokyo, and the Minamoto Yoritomo created his own capital in Kamakura. After Yormitaro took over all governing, so all of the authority was in his hands, um, he actually died. So his two sons and their mother's clan, Shuken, um, remained in power for over a century after. This is the this is Japan's most proper prosperous time in history. Um, Japan was ruled by mainly shoguns, and their titles were passed on from father to son in around 700 years. The shoguns continued to grow, and they became wealthy by claiming taxes that were owned to the emperor that they used um, to create their own private armies of samurai. So, I actually have a a uh, quick reading I want to read to you the world from the World Monarchies Dynasties by John Middleton. Um, this quick portion just kind of helps explain. So Shogun theoretically respected the position of the emperor at Kyoto, usually locating their own capitals elsewhere in practice. However, strong shoguns controlled the imperial house often determining the succession of to the imperial throne. As shogunno dynasties continued, however, shoguns themselves often lost power, lacking the divine aura that possessed the emperors. Shoguns could also be challenged by the leaders of rival noble dynasties. So the shogunate emerged from civil war fought by the houses of Japanese noble warriors in the 12th century. The first shogun is Yomitaro, Minamoto Yomitaro. Um, he established the first shogun capital, Kamakura. He held power from um, 1,000, 185, but he did not receive the title of the shogun from the for the emperor until seven years later, so in 1192. Um, 
you, so the Shogun's rule was essentially feudal based on the network of personal loyalties. After Yomotaro's death, much of the actual power of the Shogun's passed into the hands of his widow, um, which is what I talked about here. So they then, his widow and his widow's family then ruled for many years to come. Um, I will also play a video here to help summarize um, the section. As we get into the late Haiyan period, you start to have the emergence of a increasingly powerful warrior class. And all of that comes to a head in the year 1185 when the Haiyan period ends and a general by the name of Minamoto Yoritomo comes to power. And what's significant here is the notion of an emperor continues to exist, but all of the power resides in what you can essentially consider a military dictator or a shogun. And the system that emerges is known as the Bakufu system or the shogunate. And Minamoto Yoritomo was the first shogun. So you can see here the emperor still was there, but the shogun was where all of the power was. And this is really the beginning of medieval Japan. It's the beginning of the Kamakura period, named for where the capital of the Kamakura period was. Now what's distinctive about medieval Japan and the Bakufu system is that it becomes much more decentralized than what we had under the Heian period. It's often called a feudal system because it has parallels to what was going on in Europe at around the same time, where at the top you had this military ruler, the shogun, and then beneath the shogun, you had this decentralized structure of these lords essentially that controlled significant regions of Japan. They were called the daimyo, and there were roughly 300 daimyo in Japan, roughly county-sized districts. And the daimyo, in order to conquer land or to protect their own land, they would support a warrior class known as the samurai. And so they would take their agricultural surplus from their lands and use that to support this warrior class. And this warrior class, the samurai, they were analogous to knights in medieval Europe. And just as the knights had chivalry in Europe, the samurai in Japan had Bushido, which eventually emerges as their code of conduct. Despite that decentralized nature, they were able to fend off invasions from Kublai Khan. So as we've mentioned in other videos, in the 1270s, Kublai Khan is conquering much of China, and he also attempts to conquer Japan. This right over here is a picture of the Mongols shooting arrows at a samurai warrior. Now one of the key factors that keeps Kublai Khan from taking over Japan is on two different occasions as they send their boats from what we now consider to be Korea to Japan, they encounter significant storms that destroy most of the boats. And so the Mongols who are able to get to land are significantly depleted and they're pushed back by the samurai warriors. Now the Kamakura period continues on until 1333 when there is a brief, only a few years restoration of the power of the emperor. But a few years after that, another shogun comes to power and that is Ashikaga Takauji. And this is the beginning now of the Muromachi period. The Muromachi and then on to our assignment. So on this assignment, we are going to create a slideshow using the uh, slideshow template. Um, this slideshow is going to be over one period of time. So the Nara time period, the Haiyan, and the Kamakura. On our Google um, Docs, or our Google Classroom section, I have a forum for you to sign up for what time period you would like to create your slideshow. Um, I also have this article here posted on our Google if you wanted to reread anything that I just read. 
Um, and then when you're done creating your own slideshow, you will turn this into Google Docs. So I'm going to go over quickly. This is just the base of our outline that I posted in Google Docs for you to get started on this slideshow. Um, this is just because there is so much that happens during this time period that in this short lesson, I do not have time to go over. Um, I did an overall uh, lesson to introduce you, introduce to you what was going on, kind of the structure of the government. And now I want you to dig into depth of the time period. Um, so here during time period, you will put either Nara, um, Hayan, or Kamakari. I want you to talk about the emperor's role. Um, what is the emperor in charge? Who, what is the emperor doing during this time? Um, important events, is there wars? Is there um, deaths? Is there, you know, merging families? Um, families in power, so the Fujiwara clan, for example, um, families who have a lot of money and own land, the family dynamics. So there's a couple um, instances here in the early time period where the brother does not agree with the other brother. And so I would like to see if you can find anything about what's going on with their family. Sometimes they lose because that family turns their back on them. Um, so this kind of helps. The location of the events, did they create a new capital? Did they, um, what else is going on? Like, where is this happening? And the significance of the time period. Um, you can add more to this slideshow. If you can't find some of it, you can just do your best. Um, and then again, as a reminder, I would like you all to, um, submit that via Google Doc uh, or Google Classroom, my apologies. Um, so Google Classroom at the end when you are finished, and then I will look over those and review um, your assignments. And then tomorrow we are going to talk, begin to talk about the fall of Japan. So these assignments are not due for another week. Um, we I would like you to sign up for one of these and then I will, um, and our Google Classroom has a due date. It has all of the documents that I have showed you today. Um, it has a recording, my recording. You can pause, rewind. Um, if there is any questions, please just email me. And then uh, that concludes our lesson for today. And I hope you are all staying safe and well. And I am going to go ahead and end our meeting.